Hi, I'm Senator Stan Kucher, and I'm so pleased to have uh, the special guest, uh, Silicon Laman, who uh, was frankly a hero to my daughter when she was growing mm -hmm. up. Now, she didn't go into rowing, she went into soccer, but be that as it may, uh, there it was. And uh, so it's delightful to, to be able to meet you and to chat with you today. Thank you. I'm I'm pleased to be here, and uh, yeah, thanks. I, I'm glad that I was able to inspire your daughter. It's sad that she didn't follow the rowing, but uh, <laughs> that's not going to do. Many people know who you are and what you've accomplished and the things that you've done. Do you want to share just a little bit uh, about that? Yeah. So I, I was uh, uh, on the national rowing team for 13 years. I competed in four Olympic games, and I'm sort of best known to Canadians, certainly those over. 30 uh, as that would the, be mean. Uh, no, yeah, Just. Yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in 1991 I was the world champion and the world cup champion and I had an accident in the spring of 1992 uh, 10 weeks before the Olympic Games I was hit by another boat my boat shattered um, it drove 200 pieces of wood into my lower right leg my ankle was broken um, I had nerve and tendon damage and the doctors in the hospital in Germany, because I had the accident in Germany, told me that the Olympics were over. Yeah. Ten weeks later, I not only competed at the Olympic Games in Barcelona, Spain, but I won an Olympic bronze medal. And that's really how Canadians came to know me. Um, yeah. I had been a world champion, but I think the fact that I've had this accident so close to the Olympic Games, it really thrust a spotlight um, on me and what I was doing. And it became kind of a story and a touchstone for a lot of people because I think it was more than a sports story in a lot of ways. It was a, a story of, um, you know, somebody overcoming the odds. And I think that kind of story resonates for all of us because we've all had that kind of experience in our lifetime of, of overcoming the odds. Yeah, that's a that's a lovely way of putting it. I, I remember that story. Um, and, and I remember just being absolutely gobsmacked uh, how, how, how incredibly this come back. But it, it must have been some an amazing inner strength, some uh, this courage that this came from somewhere. Where did it come from? I, I guess at that time I was I was 20 something years old. Um, I, I just ha had this goal and it was to go to the Olympics and it had been this consuming goal as you can imagine Olympic athletes. That's the first thing you think of in the morning when you get up and you're completely focused on this goal and uh so when when I was told I wouldn't go to the Olympics that it wasn't possible it was like I couldn't even really hear those words I couldn't even really digest them so uh I chose to believe that I could do this and that I could get to the Olympics and in a way it was the thing that would keep me hopeful so I, I think a lot of the time in our lives like when things are going really badly you know we need to be uh, hopeful and we need to hang on to something that we're moving towards and for me that was the Olympic Games and I can honestly stand I can honestly say I don't know if I thought I really was going to make it you know because I mean I had this open wound in my leg yeah. I, I was in the hospital for 21 days 10 weeks before that so physically it doesn't really seem even today like that was really possible but my mindset was so determined uh, because my goal was so clear. I think in, in my particular case, you know, that kind of stubbornness I have, uh, that kind of resiliency and toughness uh, really came from childhood adversity. Mm. And, and, you know, it's, it's always hard when we talk about childhood adversity and abuse because nobody wants to wish it upon a, a child and it shouldn't happen to any children, but it does. And, yeah. you know, when it does, sometimes uh, the upside of it is that um, those people can be extraordinarily resilient. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's, uh, that, that's a really good way to put it because child adversity is bad for kids, but we can all learn to be resilient by other kinds of adversity as well by by being hopeful but by not not being afraid of the challenge that the adversity has given us it doesn't have to be as as overwhelming an adversity as you were facing 
Yeah. But but they're all but if everybody in this country has huge challenges or little challenges or moderate sized challenges every day. You know, you're 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 absolutely right, and we tend to try to protect our kids. I, I remember when my kids were very young and um, we, I suddenly experienced very suddenly the end of my marriage and my kids were two and four. And I remember calling a child psychologist and I said, oh, how can I protect them from this? And how can I, and you know, how can I make sure that they don't get messed up because this is happening? And the psychologist said to me, you can't protect your kids from life. You can give them the tools to help cope with the inevitable losses and challenges yeah. of life, right? And and in those days, for my kids at that age, it was talking about it. It was it was finding places to be um, playful. Um, you know, it it, it 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 was trying to be um, open about what ha- was happening. And I and I think like we all have these challenges. And so a lot of it is how we look at that challenge. I think people who are resilient, I think they. They see the world, uh, they see meaning in the world, they see meaning in their goals and dreams. Um, We all have to find a little bit of meaning and whether it's being a good friend to somebody, being a great dog owner, being a a great community leader, um, it's just all different kinds of scale of it. Yeah, that that's really well said and it resonates for me what you what you said. It's finding meaning in what you're doing, but also finding hope in what you're doing. And I particularly resonated with, with what you were saying about the mindset. I mean, uh, sometimes life sucks and sometimes really bad things happen to good people and some things just some, just don't work out well. But we can't choose what life gives us, but we can, in many cases, choose how to deal with it. Yeah, and I, and I think that's what, you know, people refer to as having agency, right? Where you you... You feel that no matter what's happening, you still have the part that you can control. So, um, you know, a lot of us, and, and me included at times, live in this illusion that we control our life. <laughs> you know, exactly. A great comfort to us. <laughs> and then something like COVID comes along and shows us all pretty clearly that we're all one, you know, health diagnosis, one, you know, medical disaster away from our whole life changing. So, What we can control is exactly what you just said. We can control our response. You know, how in this time of great stress, like, are we going to take care of ourselves? And, you know, know, where can we see the opportunities? Like, are there opportunities for, you know, deepening um, some friendships, connecting with loved ones through some of this amazing technology that we're all learning about? Zoom, FaceTime. All these different things, yeah. Five and it's like oh, we're all doing really good on our computers, but I but I think it's like it's you have to know in life what you're in control of and what you're not in control of. I wasn't in control of the fact a boat slammed into me ten weeks before the Olympic Games. I mean, in my worst you know scenarios of how that Olympic preparation would go, I never imagined that. But what I was in control of was how I responded that I started visualizing my healing, that I started making plans. And even if I had to change the plan once, twice, three times. And I think, you know, as we all come out of um, this COVID crisis, you know, we are all going to need that resiliency muscle. And, And I think in some ways, what we've all been going through is going to strengthen our resiliency muscles. And it's those people and those families and those children that, have that ability and are learning that ability to have something to look forward to and to try to take um, the driver's seat, not control, but the driver's seat Mm. in in their life. And, you know, there's plan A, there's plan B, there's plan C. I mean, after my accident, I was, I think, up to plan J. (laughs) Right. And and so so it will be with this. Well, you know, I, I, that's really, really well said. The, 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 the idea that there are things that you can control, so focusing on them is so important. But I also really like the way that you put, um, and then I'm a psychiatrist, but uh, delusion, and I actually mean that in the, in the true meaning of the word, the delusion that, that life is uh, something that we can predict. It's not. 
uh, none of our lives are predictable. Yeah, I mean, I think that the fact that most of us really are attached to that illusion or delusion, delusion as you um, phrase it, is actually part of the pain, right? So if we, you know, th through whatever practices, um, so I, so I, I meditate, um, I practice yoga, I, I'm a lifetime journaler. Um, I really um, have honed um, that self-care in my peace in my life through necessity. Yeah. I'm an extremely driven human being. I'm an extremely competitive human being. <laughs> and so for me in my life, I actually had to come to a place where all of those things weren't working for me anymore yeah. to come to that place of humility, of understanding. I had to do that inner work and that soul work. Uh, and, and now I have had, you know, now really a 20 year practice of really strong self care, because I do believe that our capacity as human beings, our capacity to be amazing parents and friends and social change makers in our, in our communities really comes down to how well we take care of ourselves. Yeah. Because that's kind of what we're bringing to the world. And it's, it's all topsy turvy in the way that our society, what they value, right? Like they, in a way, we value selflessness, and we value, you know, we when we become parents, we think we are supposed to give everything to our children, um, and that is a good parent. And we really have to, we really have to look at that and 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 start understanding that it's that investment in self and self care and uh, mental health, which is part of. Uh, that self-care equation, uh, that's where our capacity comes from. And, and there's a fine balance between ensuring that we take care of ourselves and that we don't forget to take care of others, whether that's as a parent or whether like with, with the, the work that you're doing now or, or whatever any of us do, even in this COVID crisis where, where we, 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 we want to reach out and help others with social, physical distancing in place, but to help those who are most needy and, and all sorts of different kinds of ways. And, well, I think there's a great elegance in that because, you know, what what we discover is that by reaching out and helping other people, our lives are enriched and deepened and are more, you know, coming back to this first statement around meaning, you know, when we um, feel that we have been able to help uh, another person, no matter how, you know, seemingly insignificantly, that that really helps us and helps actually helps our mental health too. Um, that, that I think the best thing you can do for your mental health is go out there and help another person. I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. And and the nice thing about not just do you and I agree on this, but there's actually a whack of research, good research that shows that that's actually the case. <laughs> Well, look, you know, I just really want to thank you so much, so much, so, so much for, for taking the time uh, to chat. It's uh, been delightful to to meet you after all these years of reading about you and hearing about you. Well, thanks for having us on, and um, it, it was my pleasure. That's wonderful. You take good care of yourself and take good care of the ones that, that you most care about and, 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 and care for. And uh, thank you so much for everything that you have done and that you are doing now. Okay, until we meet again. All right, all the best.